everyone and welcome to this live interview. Um, so exciting, happy new year as well to everybody watching. Um, I'm super excited that today um, we are um, doing this in collaboration with Time for Geography and in partnership with Harriet Watt University all the way from Scotland. Um, and we're gonna be speaking to um, Dr. Ian Patterson, who is on the screen um, now. So if Ian just gives a little wave, that'd be great. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about today is we are going to be talking about how we can reduce flood risk and the importance of land use management. So Dr. Ian Patterson is Associate Professor in Physical Geography and Leader of Geography Education in, at Harriet Watt University. Ian's research relates to holistic flood management and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, like this holistic, idea of holistic flood management and we'll be talking about why it's important to look at land use management to reduce flood risk. And it's even more important today as climate change is potentially leading to a greater magnitude and frequency of flood events. So I'm super excited. I'm going to pass over to um, Ian, who's going to start by telling us what do we mean by flood risk and how, how are people at risk of flooding in the UK? So over to you, Ian. Okay, uh, well, hi everyone, and yeah, really excited to talk to you all about this. Um, so yeah, uh, flood risk is what I'm really interested in, and main elements uh, to it. Uh, firstly, the, the probability of a, an area being inundated with water, and that's really to do with the, the hazard of flooding. Um, but to make it into a risk that is combined with there being consequences of an area uh, being uh, flooded, um, so having impacts in a, a particular area. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a, a general definition of, of flood risk. Um, but there are also uh, a few different types of uh, flooding that we can experience um, as, as well. Um, so I think there's a, 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 a slide on the screen now um, showing um, the, uh, the different types of flooding that we can experience, uh, thinking about uh, river or fluvial uh, flooding. Uh, and there's a photograph there showing the uh, Carlisle uh, floods in the northwest of England um, in 2005 and 2015, caused by the River Eden. Um, but we also can experience uh, surface water or uh, urban flooding, uh, shown there by the example of uh, Newcastle, and uh, I think that was in uh, 2012, uh, the major surface water flooding event in, in the city there. And we can also experience uh, coastal or tidal uh, flood risks as, as well. Um, and then other types of flooding, which are maybe uh, less common, um, some caused by uh, man-made infrastructure, um, such as... Um, failure of, of, of dams and uh, also the, the sewage network um, as well. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, it's quite a complicated, uh, multifaceted uh, uh, thing. Um, but yeah, lots of people in the UK are at flood risk as, as well. Um, so uh, one in six uh, properties uh, in the UK is at flood risk. Uh, so this means that there's a total of uh, 5.2 million uh, properties in, in the UK. Uh, which are at risk of some type of flooding, either from the sea, uh, rivers, or uh, from surface water uh, in urban areas. Um, and uh, some parts of the country are more susceptible to flooding than others. Um, so uh, Yorkshire and Cumbria, for example, um, are, are quite uh, have quite high uh, flood risk. Um, and you can also um, go on to the uh, Environment Agency or SEPA's website um, and um, look at your house and, and see if your house is at flood risk on the, the flood risk maps um, as well. Um, and when Ellie posed this question to me uh, in advance of the, the, the session now, um, I, I was just Googling uh, and, and looking at this and I found that it was, it, it's uh, statistically that people are more likely to be flooded uh, than burgled as well. And I thought that well, that's a really interesting uh, fact that I, I didn't know before. So, um, yeah, we're statistically more likely to be flooded than to be burgled. 
Yeah, I think because when I was looking at it and it said one in six people um, is at risk of some sort of flooding in the UK. And that is huge. And I mean, what you just said about more at risk um, than being bug with a swat, I think it really puts it into perspective um, and potentially, potentially even more people in the future as well. And I do think the Environment Agency is a really good website. So if students do want to check out their area or maybe where relatives live around the UK, um, it kind of goes pale blue, I think, if you're at flood risk. Um, so that's a really good thing to check out. Um, so your research, and I, you've researched this, we'll talk a bit about your career and where you're at, but from um, obviously from doing a degree and then a master's and PhD as well, you focus on the link between land use and river flooding. So why is it important to consider land use um, in when we are researching or understanding flooding events? Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, there's, there's two main reasons why I think it's really important to think about land use. The, the, first, uh, uh, the first one is the, the fact that flood risk is to do with the impacts of, of flooding. So it depends on what the land uses are in that area, whether that is a, a negative impact on people. Uh, on urban areas, on housing developments, on, on people's lives and, uh, and so on, or on critical infrastructure uh, like water treatment works or electricity substations, it, it's really important. Or whether it's uh, a natural floodplain which can naturally flood um, and so on. So that's uh, one reason why uh, land use is, is important. Um, but another reason, and, and this comes back to my, my research that I've done, is, is thinking about uh, that there is a, a trend uh, in, in flood risk uh, where flood uh, magnitudes and flood frequencies are increasing. Um, and hopefully there's a, a graph coming on your screens uh, now uh, um, where you can see uh, as part of my, uh, my research, I uh, reconstructed a flood record uh, for the city of Carlisle um, using documentary evidence um, right back to 1880. Um, thinking about the number of flood events that have occurred every single year uh, since uh, then. And you can really see from this graph here how um, if, if the line is steeper on this uh, plot here, uh, then it shows that uh, a lot of flood events are occurring in a, a very short uh, period of, of time, uh, which we, we've called being a, a flood rich uh, period. Um, and we're entered, we've entered one of those now uh, from about eight, uh, 1990 to the, the present day. We've really seen a, a significant number of, of flood events um, occurring. Um, and uh, this, there's been two kind of uh, causes of this being uh, suggested. Uh, firstly, climate change, um, the increasing temperatures, intensifying the um, water cycle and causing more uh, intense rainfall events, um, but also probably a factor that is thought about less but is also uh, really important is the effect of land use changes. Um, we've changed our landscape so much over uh, this time period. Um, we've expanded our cities through urbanisation. Um, we've intensified uh, our agricultural landscapes and how we use the land. Um, and we've also modified our river channels to make them straighter um, for navigation and, and other purposes as, as well. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about how we've changed land uses in the past, uh, what effect they might have had, but then how we can also work with the landscape around us to try and manage uh, the flood risk uh, going forward as, as well. Brilliant. And you've kind of talked a little bit about how different types of land use may be increased river flooding, but really how do different types? Are urban areas, for example, more at risk? What are the factors that lead to more river flooding? Yeah, OK. So, yeah, land uses, like I said before, influences the water cycle. So um, we get rainfall occurring and that has to uh, transfer from where it falls into the river systems. Uh, some of it might be infiltrated and moved down into the soil um, and, and stored in the subsurface. Um, and that's a very uh, slow pathway um, to uh, move into our rivers. Um, but if we get saturated soils or uh, impermeable surfaces that we get in urban areas, um, like you're saying there, and I think there's a, a photograph of a, a, an urban area uh, experiencing surface water uh, flooding and, and ponding, um, then um, then the the amount of infiltration is is much less. 
um, we get this built up of, of water on the surface and and, um, and therefore uh, more flooding uh, occurring. And also in urban areas, we have artificial uh, drainage systems in the subsurface as well. And that uh, funnels all of this water that falls uh, over a wide area uh, through small pipes underground much faster than it would have traveled um, had uh, we not modified the landscape in, in that way. Um, and, and also other land uses are important, such as uh, woodlands uh, and things like that, tree cover causing uh, evapotranspiration and, and losses back to the atmosphere. And all the ways in which we've modified the landscape affects these hydrological processes and, and how water moves from rainfall into runoff and, and then into uh, rivers and, and flooding. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a, a summary of, of how land uses affect uh, river flooding. Brilliant. And then in terms of um, variation within catchment areas, first of all, do you mind telling us what we mean by catchment area? Um, and how does different types of land use within the catchment area affect flooding? Yeah, OK, so uh, a catchment is the uh, the land area that uh, where the water falls and that all is funneled down into the same uh, river system. Um, so we have a, a boundary around that catchment and everything within that uh, area all uh, goes out to sea or uh, all goes to the, the same location uh, downstream. Um, so, yeah, that's the kind of the definition of a, a catchment, sometimes known as a, a watershed or a, a river basin uh, as well. Lots of different terms for the same kind of thing there. Um, fantastic. Sorry to check my audio was still on. Um, brilliant. Do we are you are we happy to go on to how maybe we can reduce flood risk or did we want to talk any more about increasing river flooding? Yeah, so there's uh, another uh, picture that I think you've got in terms of a, a map uh, of a, a rural area. Um, and yeah, I think it's really, really interesting when you uh, look at a, a satellite image of the UK um, like this, you can just see how the, the UK uh, rural uh, landscape is a, a mosaic of a, a wide range of, of different land uses um, on this uh, map here, um, which is from uh, Yorkshire, I believe. Um, you can see a, a wide range of uh, land uses such as agriculture, both pasture and arable, uh, woodland areas, urban areas uh, and so on, uh, and the, the moorlands and peatlands in the, up, the uplands as, as well. And these all these different areas behave in slightly different ways hydrologically. Uh, some uh, give the runoff uh, much faster and, and, more, uh, and greater quantities of, of runoff. And it's really the amount of them within that catchment area, um, the spatial location of them, and also the um, the arrangement of them with respect uh, to one another, um, which really result in the downstream impact um, of rainfall events um, uh, as well. And it really just demonstrates the uh, the dynamic nature of both uh, of flooding caused in, in both space and in time um, uh, as well. Um, one other uh, aspect of my, my research I've looked at in the past was to do with how a, a river channel isn't just made up of a, a single channel. It has lots of smaller tributaries that feed into that main river. Um, and the timing and the synchronization of that water coming from these different parts of the catchment is uh, very important in terms of um, the magnitude of the event uh, downstream. Um, and it's using some of those principles of understanding what generates flooding in the first place um, that we can use to try and manage the flooding uh, going forward as, as well. And we're now, if we now go on to this idea of reducing um, flood risk, but before we start, so that your research is interested in holistic flood management. So would you mind telling us what do we really mean by holistic flood management? And then how can managing the land use help to reduce flood risk for people and environments. Yeah, OK, so yeah, holistic flood management uh, is incorporating a, a wide range of different options that are out there um, for flood risk management. Um, and if we think about um, going back in time, um, the way in which we managed uh, flooding in the UK was very much from a kind of engineering perspective of, of building uh, flood walls and, and so on, right where the flooding is occurring in the cities downstream. 
and we now manage flooding from a much more uh, holistic and, and wide ranging um, perspective. Um, so we can manage the, the catchment area upstream and and, uh, and and I'll talk about that in a little bit more uh, detail in, in a bit, but also um, we can uh, warn people, we can forecast when flooding is going to occur and we, uh, we can develop models uh, to predict when that flooding is going to occur and the environment agency and the other bodies can issue warnings to people um, and yes yeah, so those are all different aspects of my research to think about how we can uh, look at different aspects of, of solving the flooding problem in the UK and it isn't just through one single uh, option it's through a whole uh, range of, of different options. Um, and then focusing in on thinking about how we can use land use to uh, reduce flooding uh, in particular. Um, this is sometimes known as working with natural uh, processes or how I like to think about it in terms of working with natural hydrological uh, processes um, as well. Um, so that's where we can work with the water cycle to manage where that water goes in the landscape so that it doesn't all arrive at the downstream point all at the same time and cause a big flood. Um, we can spread it out over time, we can store it uh, in the upstream areas, uh, we can slow the flow of the movement uh, of the water uh, downstream um, to, to manage uh, flood risk uh, kind of more holistically in a, a spatial sense. Um, as well. And this kind of uh, management technique is also very sustainable as well um, compared to engineered uh, structures um, which are, are also much more expensive uh, as well. So there's many advantages to thinking about how we can use uh, land use to, to managing flood risk, uh, but also a greater potential uncertainty associated with that um, as well. Um, because a, a flood wall with it being a particular height, you know exactly when flooding is going to occur uh, when the water exceeds that height. But with uh, using land use, it's much more uncertain about how much water you're going to store upstream um, because um, the, the ground might already be saturated uh, in the catchment, for example. Um, so um, there's uh, advantages to this technique, but also uh, we should be using it in combination uh, with um, engineered uh, structures uh, downstream as, as well. And I think you've got uh, an image of a, a field um, um, where uh, a particular area has been heavily compacted uh, by um, farming machinery. Um, and this is due to the intensification of agriculture over uh, recent decades, both through larger and heavier machinery, uh, but also uh, larger stocking densities of animals uh, in, in fields. And a lot of my research has focused in on quantifying the effect of these management practices of agriculture on the rural landscape, and but also how we can try and reduce that soil compaction uh, to uh, mean that uh, more water can be stored and infiltrated into the ground um, going through the slower uh, move, uh, pathway in the subsurface rather than the uh, rapid uh, generation of overland flow uh, connecting into our, our, our rivers. Um, so things that um, we've looked at in the past are to do with the aeration of the soil, uh, where you're basically uh, putting spikes into the soil and, and breaking the soil up um, to uh, make more, uh, space within the soil to, to store water, um, but also um, using uh, different uh, crops and, and field rotations of crops uh, can also um, aid the recovery of the, the soil um, as well as well and that reduces the levels of compaction, uh, reducing the, the runoff uh, into our, our rivers um, and, and therefore reducing flood risk uh, downstream. Uh, and this technique as well, we've also looked at the, the multiple benefits of this kind of approach as well. Um, so in terms of soil health, um, these kind of techniques uh, retain the nutrients and the fertilizer that is applied to the soil in, in farmers fields. Uh, and also it reduces the amount of erosion that is occurring in the rural landscape as, as well. And those are other benefits that we get through these uh, nature-based solutions into our uh, 
landscapes in, in the UK as well. When the hard engineered solutions downstream only solve one problem, uh, these uh, techniques have multiple uh, benefits um, upstream um, as well. Brilliant. That is really interesting. Um, so just so it is to if we go talk about what you were saying about the soil um, infiltrating more, that is it how did I'm just trying to visualize it. How do these spikes work? Do you like put them, do farmers put them in? Is it something like how does the soil break up so that it can infiltrate more? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's done through a few potential techniques. Uh, often the, uh, the, uh, the equipment is mounted to the, the back of a tractor uh, that would uh, go through the fields um, and it either spikes into the soil, uh, creating pore space uh, in the, the ground and channels uh, for that water to uh, move through um, more uh, rapidly and in greater quantities than what uh, normal infiltration uh, would have, have been. Um, and yeah, and it also has benefits for the the roots of the the the, the crops as as well because that they can't grow in very compacted soils either. Um, so it has that that benefit in terms of improving the, the whole soil stru physical structure um, of the the soil um, as well. And and through talking with farmers um, who apply these kind of techniques, they've really seen the benefits that they they get from these kind of approaches. Not just in terms of water runoff, um, but in terms of the amount of fertilizers that they need to apply each year, um, and also um, in some cases uh, getting higher yields of their crops um, uh, as well. So um, yeah, farmers are, are quite susceptible, are like are quite uh, positive about a lot of these techniques, um, and yeah, it, it's really interesting to see how these uh, approaches are, are gaining momentum in the UK and, and being my, more widely applied at, at the moment. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, and just to, to everybody watching, if you do have a question, please write it in the chat and I can ask um, in or we can at the end or we can ask it as we go through if it's um, part of what we're talking about at the moment. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's all about kind of loosening that soil, as you said, so you can increase infiltration rates and therefore it not leading to more overland flow and then potentially flooding downstream. Um, and you said farmers are really positive. Do you think that is something that can be used in the future? Is it quite feasible? What do you see this basically being used in the future to reduce flood risk? Yeah, um, so I think that um, it's much more novel uh, compared to kind of traditional ways of managing flooding. And there are obviously uncertainties and things that we don't know at the moment. Um, but um, since these kind of techniques have started to be thought about more, um, they're being applied much more widely. Um, the Environment Agency uh, ran a pilot project of uh, natural flood management um, a couple of years ago. Um, and they recently announced how um, they're going to uh, put more of their funding into this kind of management of flooding rather than um, hard engineered uh, solutions to, to flooding as well. Um, so that evidence is building up and uh, farmers are becoming more positive about these kind of techniques. Um, I also think that there, there are still some barriers to uh, using these uh, approaches as well. Probably the biggest one is the kind of the financial incentive for farmers to uh, to manage their land in a particular way, um, which doesn't always benefit them, but it benefits people downstream um, from flooding. Um, and who should pay for that is a, a question that no one's really answered uh, yet. So um, really lots of things to still think about, um, but definitely uh, a technique that warrants more investigation and uh, is growing in appeal as, as well. Brilliant. And what other... Um just techniques so obviously we talked about how actually farmers manage it and yeah I completely see they might be managing their land but it that will reduce the flood risk for many people maybe downstream so they don't see those maybe immediate impacts themselves um are there any other sort of management um, methods in GCSE or a level students learn about afforestation so kind of um particularly in maybe more upland areas um but what are the other kind of just obviously don't go into them as in depth as you have been just before, but just to give an idea. Yeah, so yeah, lots of different ways in which we can um, like use land use to uh, manage flooding. 
um, such as uh, afforestation, like you were mentioning there, how we can lose water through evapotranspiration uh, via that um, greater um, uh, forestry land cover, um, how we can restore our river channels as well, so how they've been straightened in the past, and that kind of funnels the water quickly downstream. So if we re-meander our river channels and restore um, their kind of natural um, shape, um, and plan form, um, then that can have uh, benefits for slowing the movement of, of water. Um, there's a, a growing trend of um, putting woody debris into river channels to block the w passage of water downstream and, and hold it back uh, and slow the flow of the, the movement of water uh, downstream. And then there's also other things that um, kind of buffer strips between the uh, farmer's field and the river channel itself. So that kind of disconnects the pathway of runoff uh, from the, the field into the river channel um, and also a storage of water in, in things like ponds and also in wetlands as, as well. Uh, wetlands have lots of other benefits um, through uh, biogeochemical cycling of, of nitrogen and phosphorus as, as well. Um, so, yeah, lots of different, uh, a wide range of different options, um, which are kind of collectively known as natural flood management. Brilliant. And um, just a quick question before we move on to the last one was, why, why do you personally think it's more important to do these natural um, flood management techniques rather than, say, building a... Uh, a flood wall. Yeah, um, so I think that building ever higher and higher flood walls is going to become unsustainable in the future, uh, particularly with climate change, um, meaning that we're going to have to um, build them higher. Obviously, it's much more expensive um, to do that hard engineering um, as well. Um, and But what I think is the really exciting thing about these natural ways of managing flooding is um, we can manage the flooding problem, but we also get lots of other benefits uh, from them as, as well. So in terms of water quality, biodiversity, um, uh, and so on as well. So those multiple benefits of, of these more sustainable uh, methods um, are, are, are probably the, the main reason why I think that it's a, a positive direction in which we're moving. And for a question from our A-level geographers, and I know that you've done some research in this, is sustainable urban drainage systems. So this is more about fl reducing flood risk within your urban areas. So what are sustainable urban drainage systems or SUDS and why are they important? Yeah, OK, so sustainable urban drainage systems are basically very similar to what we've been talking about so far, working with that natural water cycle, um, but this time in urban areas. So uh, the solutions in urban areas to to solve the flooding problem through working with the natural hydrology. Um, and the, the very common uh, in new residential uh, developments um, and uh, a, a sustainable way of, of managing um, that runoff that is generated by increasingly the, the amount of impermeable surfaces in the urban area um, by storing the water um, either where that rainfall uh, falls. So there's, uh, there's different types of sustainable urban drainage uh, systems. Um, so, for example, uh, green roofs um, kind of store the water um, where it falls um, in the, the, the soil substrate of the, the green roofs and we lose water back to the atmosphere uh, through evapotranspiration. Um, we also can have uh, uh, pervious uh, pavements as well. Um, so rather than having uh, impermeable uh, surfaces in our urban areas that we uh, that water doesn't infiltrate uh, through, uh, we can... Uh, make the, the materials pervious, or we can leave spaces between those blocks um, so that we still get that infiltration uh, occurring at the, the, the point where that rain water falls. Um, and and the, the main reason for suds is that the amount of runoff uh, from a new development uh, shouldn't exceed what the runoff was before that development uh, was put in place. Um, so, um, there are other ways in which we can manage the uh, flooding problem at that site scale uh, through using suds, uh, such as uh, detention or retention ponds. 
um, or wetland uh, features, um, or also swales which direct the water uh, in a particular pathway on the surface uh, rather than the subsurface in, in pipes, uh, which we've already said is a much uh, slower uh, pathway on the surface rather than the subsurface. So that brings these um, benefits in, in terms of, of flooding. And we can use these uh, wide range of different suds in combination uh, with one another as well. Um, so um, there's a, a piece of research that we carried out um, a few years ago now, um, and this is a, a photograph graph here of um, a treatment train, uh, which is where uh, different suds are combined in sequence uh, with one another. Um, so this was at a university in America, uh, Villanova University in Philadelphia, uh, which I visited and, and carried out these experiments uh, on. And there was a, a multi-story car park uh, right at the bottom uh, right of this image was where the, the pipes from this multi-story car park uh, led down uh, to the ground. And it fed into uh, a series of, of swales and then two rain gardens, which you can see at the bottom there with the yellow and the grey dots uh, on these images. And we carried out uh, an experiment uh, here uh, using a dye. So it was a, a coloured dye that we inserted into the water at the uh, inlet into this uh, sustainable urban drainage uh, system. And we collected samples of the concentration of that dye at each of the points uh, shown by the, the dots uh, on that uh, photograph. And the, the graph there uh, shows the results of the concentration of the dye at each of those uh, points uh, through time. And what this uh, really clearly demonstrates is the, um, the process of uh, attenuation, um, which is where the hydrograph is both reduced in magnitude and also stretched out in time. Um, so um, you can see at the, the first one, the blue, it's a very flashy hydrograph, very up and down in, it, in its shape, high magnitude. But then when we funnel that water through a swale and then through the rain gardens, that uh, the amount of water and the amount of dye is much lower uh, than it was uh, before. And we've slowed the movement of that water through the system. Um, and spread it out uh, over a much longer time period. Um, so this really demonstrates how these uh, sustainable urban drainage systems are working um, by uh, initiating this natural uh, process of storage of water, slowing the flow um, through the vegetation and the friction that that generates that you can see, um, and therefore reducing the magnitude of the, the flood events uh, downstream as, as well. And we just had a quick question in um, from Square. If you just wouldn't mind saying what a swale is for our audience. Yeah, OK. Um, so, yeah, so a swale is a, um, a, a gentle sloping depression in the landscape, um, like a, a small uh, channel, um, but it's quite it's very shallow. Um, and um, these are used to uh, funnel the water um, in a more controlled way um, than they would do over a, a natural area. Um, and also they initiate uh, friction and, and the roughness of these uh, features uh, slow the movement of, of water um, as well. So you can see that up until the orange uh, dot on this image here are swales, uh, which are basically small depressions uh, in, in this case kind of meandering around, which will also uh, cause more uh, slowing of the flow as, as, as well, um, but it kind of controls the, the movement of water from where it falls to where you want it to go, and it slows the movement of water as well, rather than it going into the subsurface in a, a drain, uh, and that would be a much faster pathway. Um, did you say what they were made out of? Um, so they're uh, just um, natural uh, depression, well, not natural, but kind of uh, put into the landscape in, in, in these uh, locations. Sometimes they have a substrate um, or soil type that is 
uh, particularly permeable to initiate uh, more infiltration than you would get in a uh, kind of in the land either side of it. Um, but they are basically just a, a small channel or ditch that uh, people have dug. Brilliant. So a range of different, um, again, methods that we can maybe use in urban areas um, as well. Brilliant. So I'm just going to um, leave it up to the audience if there's any more um, any viewers, if they've got any more questions. And then kind of one question we ask um, all our guests is kind of how did you get um, to where you are today? Um, you were telling um, me that one of your favourite things about geography was kind of understanding these kind of like real world issues. Um, and also field work as well. So how did you decide um, kind of your journey um, to, yeah, to get to where you are today? And then also what advice do you have? Now, um, I know that you played a big role um, in Herit Bot on university in kind of our students and um, students going to university as well. So what advice do you have for students who are making their next steps after maybe school geography? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I think that my the, the way in which I've got into the job that I do now is is um, quite a linear path, I would say. So I was really inspired when I was at um, secondary school and, and sixth form um, by my geography teachers um, to um, to do geography, and I think the reason for that was because of its practical nature um, to get outside and do field work and collect data. Um, in the natural landscape, which was, it's, I just find it a really inspiring uh, thing to look at and, and learn more um, about. And um, yeah, I just found it a, re a subject that was um, really relevant to the issues that we're uh, addressing um, now and, and solving those uh, problems and, and challenges is, is something that really inspires me. Um, so yeah, I, I, I went to university to uh, do geography. I was uh, the first generation of my family to go to uh, university. Um, so I went to uh, Durham to do a BSc in, in geography. Um, and then uh, from there, just carried on um, to do a, um, a PhD. Um, and yeah, I was, re I was interested in all different types of geography, uh, rivers, glaciers, coasts, uh, all different, different uh, types of, of natural landscape. And I think the, the biggest challenge I had was deciding which of these I wanted to focus in on um, to do my PhD. It's a, a very specialised, uh, focused uh, thing. Um, and I, I think I chose to do my PhD on rivers and, and flooding. Um, because it's it's a very applied topic, um, solving this problem uh, in the UK, and it's uh, an ever-growing problem in the UK with climate change as, as well. So I found it a really interesting area to to to, to start off in, um, and yeah, just uh, from there carried on uh, in research, um, and then became a lecturer at university. And yeah, I, I find it really interesting to um, teach. Uh, this kind of uh, stuff to the students as, as well, um, linking it back to my research and, and getting the students involved in my research as, as well um, to kind of hopefully inspire uh, them uh, to do uh, kind of similar things going forwards, whether it's in academia or um, in industry, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a ever growing important topic that we need to get on top of in the UK. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's how I've, I've got to where I, I am now, really. Um, and yeah, um, the, the other question that you posed was to do with the advice that I have for uh, students. And yeah, uh, when you sent this question through to me, I was thinking what I would say was the, the most important piece of advice I could give. And I kind of got it down to like a, a short list of four things I, I've got here. So I'll, I'll just uh, go through each one. Um, the first one is to explore all your options and, and, and the wide range of different options out there and not feel the pressure to decide exactly what you want to do immediately um, and to take your time to explore the options and decide what really inspires you and, and, and so on. Um, and I suppose that's similar to what I did in deciding what I wanted to do my PhD on. I, I consider a, a wide range of different things and, and decide what I wanted to, to focus in on, on, on from there. But it, the second bit of advice really is to, to choose something that really interests you and in, inspires you every day. 
Um, and this is, I think, really important because thinking about future careers, and, and there's so many different careers that people can go into with a, a geography degree, um, but uh, choosing something that inspires you on a daily basis, I think, is um, a really interesting, important thing. Um, and as someone who is relatively early in their career, uh, I, I think it's, um, from my perspective, I've got a long career in front of me. If I wasn't really inspired every day to, to do it, then it wouldn't be good so yeah choosing what you want to do really carefully and choose something that really inspires you um i think is is really important and um, the third bit of advice i would say is to sometimes to go outside of your comfort zone and to challenge yourself um as well because if you um don't do that you don't um kind of see what options or possibilities are out there um, and yeah, I, I think from my own perspective um, on, on this is to um, to consider uh, for my my journey, I would say is to consider a wide range of universities. Um, and they don't necessarily. I I went to Durham University, which is relatively near from where I come from. Um, and then since then, I've kind of gone to universities throughout the UK. Um, and that was kind of out of my comfort zone to go like to different parts of the, the country and, and work. And yeah, the benefits that that's brought to me, I think, is is really positive. So to go outside of your comfort zone and challenge yourself, I think, uh, pays off and, and, and brings uh, benefits. And then the, the final piece of advice I would uh, give to people um, is to uh, ask for support from others as, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, talk to other students about what they're interested in, um, talk to uh, your teachers and um, go to open days and, and find out about uh, university courses. Um, and and uh, all of those people will be very happy to answer all of your questions and, and so on. So don't be uh, scared to reach out to people um, and ask uh, these kind of questions because, yeah, yeah. From my perspective, I'd be really excited if a, a prospective geography student wanted to ask me uh, a question. So, um, yeah, ask for support and, and talk to us. This is my, my final thought there. Brilliant. That was so good. Thank you so much for taking time to really think about the advice to give to students. And I think that's so to be, be its own little video in itself. That was really, really clear. Thank you so, so much. Um, a huge thank you um, in from myself time for geography as well um, on kind of sharing your research and ideas about holistic flood management it's been so interesting to hear how some quite small changes or can make huge amount of differences as in thinking about the soil properties and how that can be so important for future risk reducing future risk um, particularly as we go back to the very beginning when we talked about one in six people being at risk from flooding in the UK so thank you so much for explaining all your ideas so um so clearly and um giving that detail to our to everybody watching so for me and everybody thank you so much for being involved in this okay you know yeah thank you and you're welcome i find i find it really interesting to to talk through these things so yeah, thank you very much i'm just gonna let our audience know um what's coming up next so um in a couple of weeks on monday the 23rd of january um i'm going to be speaking um uh, live on um, YouTube in Time for Geography about fast fashion um, with our guest Amber who's joining us and then if you are interested in the previous live interviews they are all up on Time for Geography and there will be shortened clips that can be used in the classroom so it is um, just had a question they both are all online as well so you can either use this link and time for geography as well and we've got lots of thanks coming in um ian as well so a huge thank you and goodbye from me time for geography and from ian as well i hope you all guys have a lovely evening